Anybody need supernatural supply? Every day. Supernatural supply. So what the Lord gave me was a map to supernatural supply. You want it? You want it? All right. I was just reading in Mark the other day, and I was just going through my Bible. I wasn't like looking for anything in particular. It was just in my daily reading where I'm reading certain things each day. And, and I came to this, this passage of Scripture, and I've read it, I don't know how many times, a lot. And the Lord just started showing me this is more than what you think. So I started digging in it, and I said, wow, this is more than just a story. This is a map. We got to dig in the word. We have to dig in the word. We got to pray for revelation. Father, show me what you're really saying. Because you know, the disciples heard Jesus tell stories all the time. And then the, when they would go away, they're like, man, there was more to what he was saying. There was more. To, so, you know, he wasn't really talking about, he wasn't really talking about this farmer's son that ran off and, or this, Rich man's son that ran off and fed, fed pig. He wasn't really talking about that. Jesus, what were you talking about? So he break it down, right? So when we read the word, before, during, after, pray. Holy Spirit, show me. Show me what you're really trying to say. And he, you'll start seeing the word in ways that you never saw before. But this is that passage of scriptures. It's in Mark 14, 13 through 15. And he sent out two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you, carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. Whoa. All right, look, here's something else I like to do when I read the Word. I like to put myself there. So imagine yourself as this man carrying this pitcher of water. And do you, do you know what the disciples look like? You, have you ever looked at this, this menagerie of men? And some of them are pretty rough characters. Some of them, some of them might have been pretty rough. They they weren't the, the necessarily the cream of the crop when he started out with them. Okay, so he gets this menagerie of men, and he says, "Now go to town." And when you see this man, follow him. Well, Jesus, where's he going? He's going to go home. But follow him home. And when he goes in his house, go with him. I want you to picture that. What do you think this guy's thinking? He just went to get some water and he's going back home. Are they following me or are they just going the same way? But what do you think when he got gets to his house? And they're still there. And then they come on in, make themselves at home. He says, wherever he wherever he goes in. Say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where's your guest room? <laughs> Put yourself in this guy's place. They follow him home, walk in his house, and say, hey, Jesus wants to know where's your guest room. What are you doing in my house? You smell like fish. Get out of here. Where is your guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large upper room. Furnished and prepared. There make ready for us. So I read that. Have you read that? If you haven't, you've at least probably heard it. Well, as I'm reading this, I stopped and I said, Lord, what are you saying? This is more than just you sent some disciples to follow this man so you could go eat dinner at his house. So we broke it down. He sent out two of his disciples. They were commissioned. They were deployed. He sent them out. They were deployed. They were given their marching orders. Just like you and I have been sent out into this world on a mission. Do you realize you've been deployed? Do you realize that you weren't saved just to get to heaven? If you were saved just to get to heaven, you'd be there already. If, if the reason you were saved was to get to heaven, when you accepted him as your Savior, he would have just taken you home. But you weren't saved just to get to heaven. 
You were saved to fulfill a mission while you were here before you get to heaven. You were saved because he created you with a purpose and a plan. You've been deployed. You've been put into active duty. How many military men we got? But we got several that have been in the military. When you were deployed, was it optional? If you were deployed, was it optional? Did you say, no, I don't want to go there? Is that where you would have chose to go? Maybe my dad. He got deployed to Hawaii. That's pretty good. But yeah, I was born there. It didn't have to be there. It could have been anywhere. And truth is, you really didn't want to be there either, did you? Not really. But you go where you're sent. Because you enlisted. If you didn't want to go where you were sent, you wouldn't be enlisted. I've got a good friend that said his son told him, I don't like people telling me what to do. So I'm going to join the Marines. Hello. But when you enlisted, it was with the understanding that I may be deployed and I may have to go somewhere I don't want to go and I may have to do things I don't want to do. But sometimes you find out that was the best thing that could have happened to you. Right? You met your wife there, huh? Best thing that ever happened to you, huh? I was born there. Best thing ever happened to you, huh? <laughs> it, it's just, just an understanding of when you enlist. I may have to go where I don't want to go. And I may have to do what I don't want to do. And honestly, that's salvation. When you say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. What's that mean? Lord, you may take me where I don't want to go. This ain't, look, this ain't a popular message. This don't build up a big congregation, but it builds a congregation of big people because this is reality. This is the reality of the salvation that you chose. So what does it mean? I'll go where you send me. You think the disciples were serious about that? Because for some of them, it sent them to a cross, just like Jesus. And to some of them, it sent them to the edge of a sword. And some of them, it, it sent them into a den of lions. And some of them, it sent them into boiling oil. And we could go on and on. But they said, nevertheless, this is the life I signed up for. I'm enlisted. And no matter where I'm sent, I'm going to go. You've been sent out. You've been sent out to the world on a mission. You're on a mission. We get so distracted that we forget we're on a mission. We get so distracted. Have you noticed how many distractions there are? Have you, have you noticed that we're in a world of distraction? But in front of us, there's an impossibility that we're supposed to be walking toward. But as we go toward it, we, we seem to be distracted on every side, and there's things happening here, and there's things happening there. But you know what? In spite of the distraction, you can't lose sight of your mission. What's going on in our country? A lot of stuff. Turmoil. Why? Why is it happening? Because it's a distraction. It's a distraction from what we're not supposed to be looking at, or what we're really supposed to be looking at, but nobody wants us to look at. We can't get distracted, and I'm not going to get political. I could easily do it, but I don't want to, because it would be a distraction. Because it's really not political a political issue at all, and the distractions aren't political either. They're really kingdom stuff. It's really distractions away from what the kingdom of darkness is trying to do in this country, and if the church falls for the bait, and we get so distracted that we forget to pray, and all we do is complain, well, guess what? The distraction works. 
But I mean, even in our own private lives, we get so distracted. We all get busy, right? And we can get so busy in doing the things that we need to do, the things that we feel that we have to do, the things that we feel are required of us, that we really forget what we're here living for. Look, we can get so distracted by the ministry, we forget to be ministers. Because the ministry can be very consuming, and it can get very busy. But if, if we allow ourselves to be distracted by the busyness of it, we forget to do the very things Jesus called us to do. And that's to make disciples. And if I'm not make, making disciples, then what am I here for? And that's you too. That's your commission too. So Jesus, we're going to go back, get back onto this passage. So he said he sent them out, two of his disciples out. And what's the first thing he said to them? What's the first word he said to them? You can just leave it up there, Tyler, because we're going to keep going back to it. What's the first word he said to them? Go. Go. Uh, that, everything that followed hinged on that word. Because at that moment, they could have said no. Then everything that followed wouldn't happen. And so everything, so we're still talking about supernatural supply. So supernatural supply, that's the word, that's the first word that we get on this map of supernatural supply. So if I refuse to go, well, I forfeit everything Jesus put on the banquet table for me. I, 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 because if I refuse to go, well, then there's no reason for supernatural supply. Because the supply, after all, is to sustain my calling. And if I'm not moving in my calling, then, then there's no need for the supply. Go. That's the command. Go was the command for the disciples, and it's still the command for us today. That's still our mandate. It's still our mandate. Look, let's look here. Matthew 28, 19, 20. Let's see what Jesus said to us. Go, therefore. Who's he talking to? Who's he talking to right here? Us, each one of us. Go, therefore. For what, Lord? To make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of this age. So, Lord, what are you telling me to do? Go. Where? Where I send you. How will I do it? Because I'm going to go with you. Now, those of you who were, were, were military men and women, when you were deployed, if you'd have been sent on your mission alone, would it have worked out? No. But when you go with the backing of the United States of America and, and everything that, that is in, entrusted to them to supply you and to sustain you and to protect you, well, now you have a little bit of security, right? Yeah. But if, you just a, a, if you're just a, a mercenary and you step out on your own, well, good luck. But when you've been deployed by the greatest nation in the earth, on the earth, well, then you've got a little bit more security. When I watched that desert storm, you remember how they put the footage on TV? Do you realize how overwhelmed those armies were? when we sent our forces there. They were over... The media didn't always paint that picture. And it looked like we were barely holding on and trying... No. Dennis, you were there, right? I got a lot of friends that were there that came back and said, man, we didn't have to fight. We just had to show up. And when we showed up, they laid their guns down and ran to us. Said, save us. Why? Because when we showed up, what did they call that? They called it shock and awe. Because they, I, I'm, I may seem facetious, but this is honestly how it was. Some of these guys were throwing rocks, right? We show up with stealth bombers and stuff that they ain't never even seen before. And it was all inspiring. Well, that's how we got to see ourselves when, we, when we're, when we're being deployed by the army of God? What's at our disposal? The full backing of the kingdom. He said, I am with you always, even to the end of this age. And we sing about how nothing's impossible for our God. Who can stand before my God and all these things that we sing? But we don't always realize the, the reality of it. 
we don't realize the reality of it. We don't realize that all we have to do because of the authority that's been given to us is speak the name and impossibles become realities and demons flee and they put down their weapons and run and say, have mercy. What, how did they respond to Jesus? The demon in the, in the tombs of the, the Gadarenes, what did he do? Jesus didn't even have to go find him. He ran to him and bowed down. Son of God, have mercy on me. That's your enemy. The one who distracts us. The one who, why does he distract you? So you don't even move toward him. So you don't take back ground. So you don't step into your calling. So the distractions come and they keep us busy all the time. And we forget we're building a kingdom here. So where did he send them? Into the city. So into the city was the destination. The city was the destination for the disciples, but the world is the destination for us. We've been called to bring this gospel to the world. Look, a generation ago, that was a daunting task. That was like, how am I going to do that? It's going to take me a bunch of airplane tickets, right? How are we doing it today? Right there, from that phone, right there. I'm speaking to people around the world. That's mind-boggling. Our mandate is to bring this gospel to the world. Now, the world for you may not be everywhere, but it's at least your world. It's at least the ones you have influence over. It's at least the ones that you visit with every day, the ones that live in your home maybe, the ones that, the, the ones that share your DNA. The ones that you're on your job with, the ones you go to school with, the ones that wherever, the ones that you run into at the grocery store, the ones that you run into wherever you go. That might be your world, but we still have to get back to, I'm deployed. I'm deployed, and I'm not an undercover agent. I'm not fussing. I'm intense. I'm not angry. I'm not mad at all. I'm just a little intense, and I take this serious. Am I perfect in it? No, because sometimes I get distracted too, and sometimes I just want to go get the gallon of milk and go home. And sometimes I'm just tired. But I can never lose sight of what I'm called here to do. I'm called to be an ambassador of Christ, and I don't ever get to punch out, and neither do you although sometimes I want to. It's not an option because I'm enlisted. When you were enlisted, did you get to pick your hours? Look, I work from 10 to noon, 1 to 4. Did you get to say that? No. Natalie came to me the other night. It was like 11 o'clock at night, and she said, I need to go over some stuff with you. It was church stuff. I said, wait. I'm off the clock. We can talk about it tomorrow. She just laughed because she knew I was joking because the clock never, we never punch out. We know we don't get to. Neither do you as a child of God. When's the, when is the ministry over? When you check out and go home. That's when we get to punch out. So the city was their destination. The world is your destination. Now your specific destination is personal and it has to do with your calling. Where has God called you to? Where is your city? Where is the place that God's called you to? You ought to know. If you don't know, say, God, show me. He's not trying to keep this a secret. He's not. If, if you have something for your child to do, do you keep it a secret? Then whip them because they didn't do it. No, I hope not. You at least tell them and you give them a chance to do it, right? You expect them to. I heard something the other day, and it just kind of, it woke me up. It was, it was talking about raising kids, but they compared it to your dog and your horse. And the question was, how many times do you have to tell your dog and your horse to do something? And that's a reflection of you and what you accept. 
And it works the same way with giving. How many times do we have to say to do something? Because it's a reflection of ourself and what we're willing to accept. If I tell my dog, sit, she ought to sit. And if she don't, there ought to be some consequences for it. I ought not to have to say it four or five times and plead with her to do what I ask. After all, I take care of all of her needs. I don't ask much of her. Sit, stay, go get the duck, bring it back. That's about it. So how much am I willing to compromise with her? Same with my horse. Because you know what? Where I give a little, they're going to push me to give a little more. And a little more. And before you know it, one of my pet peeves with a horse is not standing still. If we stop, you ought to stand still. If you're still wiggling around, we need to do something. Because the more I let you wiggle, this is going to escalate. So we're going to bring that back under control pretty quick. I'm just saying Look, look, look at your world and see what you compromise with and what you allow. And it, you may not have a horse nor a dog. You may not even have a child. But if you survey your life, what do you, where are you willing to compromise? Where are you willing to say, well, that's okay? Just a thought I was having. Where has God called you to? What, he's, what has he said for you to do personally? Lord, I know you said to me, go, but where do you want me to go? And when I get there, what do you want me to do? Well, that's specific, and I can't answer that for you. That's between you and God. What your ministry looks like is specific to you, and it may look nothing like mine. And that's okay, because we all play a different role. We're members of the body of Christ, and some are hands, and some are feet, and some are mouths, and some are ears, and some are noses, and some are toes, and some are toenails, and... I don't know your role. Some of you I do. Some of them the Lord shows me. So I can kind of help you along in that. But not always. But we all have to find out, what's my role, God? Where have you called me to and what have you called me to do when I get there? Where am I supposed to be and what am I supposed to be doing? Look, if we don't do that, I'm still talking about supernatural supply. I'm still talking about how do I get the supernatural supply? Well. Why would God supply me if I ain't going nowhere? Why would I start getting a bunch of gear together to go camping if I ain't going camping? That would be a waste of time. So the things I'm praying, God, I need your, your supply in this area. I need supernatural provision. What's he providing for? It may be my demise. Honestly. Because there's a lot of people that pray for money, and if God would give it to them, it would destroy them. What am I supposed to be doing, God? Then, then he goes on to say, when you've gone, go, where, Lord? To the city. And when you get there, what am I there for? There'll be a man. There'll be a man that'll meet you. There's a man that'll meet you. That's divine appointments. Divine appointments. If you look back over your life, most of the good things that have happened to you are because you ran into somebody somewhere. Is that true? You didn't even know they were going to be there probably. You may have not ever even heard from heard of them before, but you meet them somewhere, then they say, hey, I got something you might be interested in. You might just go to wash your truck, huh, Brother Fred? And then the man sees you and says, you a welder? Well, duh, I'm driving a welding rig. You need a job? Right? Didn't go there looking for a job, but just got through praying for one. You might go into the store with your shirt on. You're an instructor? You're a shooting instructor? I'm talking about a divine appointment. How many times have we gone somewhere and there's somebody that God's placed there that it, we walk right into our need being met and we had no idea they were there? Your life has probably been shaped by divine appointments. You probably met your spouse by divine appointment. Don't say it was a demonic appointment. I said it was a divine appointment. It was not a distraction of the devil. <laughs> Uh, 
But see, the divine appointment is hinged on your response to the command go. Your divine appointment is hinged on your response to go. Because if you don't go, God might have had that person right there at that time, but if you didn't go, you ain't never going to meet them. That one that had exactly what you needed and was looking for somebody to give it to. You had a need to get it, and he had a need to get rid of it. But if you weren't there when he was there, you missed out and he gave it to someone else. How many times, how many times have you called somebody about something that, oh man, we just got rid of it. But how many times has that happened and you don't even know? How many times has there been somewhere that you were supposed to be, but you never showed up because you didn't feel like going? You felt like sleeping in. You had other things to do. You got distracted along the way. I don't even want to know. I don't even want to know. Look, I went through this last night. God's put on my heart to call someone in another state far, far away. And I said, I don't want to call them. Not right now. I do want to call. I do want to talk to them. But right now, I'm doing something. Man, the Lord just reminded me. What are you doing that's more important than what I'm telling you to do? What, what are you doing that's more important than what I'm telling you to do? It goes back to my dog and my horse. How many times did God have to speak to me? Because here's the thing with God. God speaks to me. I don't move. Guess what? God just goes on to someone else. He told me that a long time ago concerning me being the pastor here. I wasn't his first choice. I was just the first one that did it. There was others he went to before me. And they didn't move. How many other things in my life has he moved on to someone else because I didn't move? I don't want to know. How many divine appointments have I missed? Because I didn't move with. Not Look, here's, here's not only the obedience, it's time sensitive. Because if he tells me to go to a certain place, I don't need to ask, stop and take the time to ask why. I need to go. Because if I delay that divine appointment, it may be gone when I get there. I might have obeyed, but not when he said to obey, and I might have missed my appointment anyway. Because it's time sensitive. The opportunity of a lifetime is only good for what? The lifetime of the opportunity. So when the lifetime of that opportunity is gone, the opportunity of a lifetime may be gone forever. Time sensitive. He said, a man will meet you. But he also said you have to recognize him. Because there's going to be a distinction about it. You have to, look, you might have a divine encounter, but if you don't recognize it, you may never seize the opportunity. Not only do you have to be there, but you've got to be able to recognize it. This is a God thing. This, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm not just here by chance, as though I thought. I'm here because I recognize a situation where I'm fixing to have a divine encounter with this person. A divine encounter. You have to recognize it. If you fail to recognize the opportunity of a lifetime, it may pass you by. It may pass you by. It may be the biggest deal you ever got. It might, be, it might be the opportunity you've been waiting for. But if you don't recognize it, it might pass you by. That's why we live by this, by this rule. Be careful of what you say no to. We talked about that some last week. Be careful about what you say no to. Because it's the things that you said no to that cap your, your potential. Because you might not recognize it as being the opportunity of a lifetime. How many things that have you moved into very reluctantly and you thought, man, I shouldn't be doing this. I don't have time for this. And then you find out, this is what I needed to be doing all along. This is the best thing I ever could have ever done. In spite of what everybody else told me, how ridiculous this was. Carrying a pitcher of water. Carrying a pitcher of water. Water represents, is a representation of the Holy Spirit. You will recognize your divine encounter by the presence of the Holy Spirit. 
but you have to be looking. That don't mean that person's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. This guy wasn't filled with water. He was just carrying it. So that don't mean that person's filled with the Holy Spirit. He may be full of the devil. But that don't mean God can't bless you through him. You, you with me? That don't mean God can't bless you through them. In fact, often that's how he does it. Because God, if we're talking about money, let's just say God's always trying to get money transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. So it's very often that God may use someone who, who's nowhere near the kingdom of God to bless you. But we have to recognize. So we have to recognize the presence of the Holy Spirit, not necessarily in that person, but on the encounter. And then we pursue it because we recognize, hey, this is a God thing. Look, I'm talking about supernatural supply. I just I brought up money. It may not have nothing to do with money. Because God don't always use money to get you the things that you need. We tend to think that way. Because when we have a need, what do we always look for? Money. Coins, clocks, calendars, and circumstances is what the carnal mind thinks in. So we always look to the purse to see what's in it. When God said, hold on, whoa, whoa. Isn't that what the disciples did? Jesus got 5,000 men plus their wives and kids on the hillside. And the disciples came to him and said, Lord, all these people getting hungry. What were they really saying? Lord, we're getting hungry, but we're going to blame it on these people. So you need to cut this sermon short. we got to get to town. So what was Jesus' response to them? Feed them. They're getting hungry? Well, feed them. So what did they do? They looked in the money bag. They said, but Lord, we don't have enough money to buy food for all these people. He said, I never even mentioned money. Why would you look to money? I never said I never mentioned money. I just said feed them. But we don't have enough money. He said, okay, what do you have? Well, what do you have? Well, we got the little boy sack lunch. Well, then feed them. It's a two-piece fish dinner, Lord. Well, feed them. You give it to me and let me multiply it. What you need is always going to be a multiplication of something you already have. What you need will always be a multiplication of something that you already have. But God can't multiply it if you don't put it in his hand. His hand. What did he say? Well, Lord, what do you have? He said, well, he said we got a two-piece fish dinner. He said, what? Give it to me. And when they gave it to Jesus, it said he looked up and he blessed it. Look, this is, how we, this is how we give our tithe and offering. We lift it up and we bless it. And then God says, if you lift it up to me and bless it, I'll multiply it. That's what we live on. What do you do for a living, Brian? I follow the blessing of God and I lift up what he puts in my hand and he multiplies it and I just keep on going. And I never lack any good thing. He supplies all of my needs. He has never let me down. No, not once. Not once has God failed me. That doesn't mean I don't sometimes get scared and thinking, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? Just like I heard somebody else might do. But I have to get myself under grip to say the word of God is truth. And I've seen it demonstrated over and over and over and he never failed me yet and he's not going to fail me this time either and God always comes through it don't mean it's there way in advance in advance but he ain't never late he's usually right on time he don't get there early enough for me to not fret over it or to be tempted to anyway he gives me that option recognize Recognize, look, if we get distracted by the demonic, we will not recognize our divine encounter. If we get distracted by the demonic, we will fail to recognize when we're having a divine encounter because we're too worried about what's going on over there than when right in front of us there's the greatest opportunity of our lifetime. And we didn't see it because the devil was stirring up something to our right or to our left. All right, so after you see the man with the pitcher of water, what's he say? Follow him. Specific instruction. That's specific instruction. God has a plan. 
but success or failure determined by you following the plan. I can give you directions to my house, but if you choose to not follow them, it's not my fault if you get lost. So God gives us a plan for success. If we fail, it ain't his fault. If he give me a plan for success and I say, nah, I can make it on my own without that plan, well, good luck. Good luck. Y'all with me? Specific instruction. I, all right, let me see. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts, some translations say plans, that I have for you, toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts are a plan of peace and not evil to give you a future and a hope. What's God want for you? Future and hope. Good and not evil. Blessing and not cursing. Exceeding abundance. That's what God wants for you. But you having, having it depends on your willingness to follow the plan he lays out for you. God's plan is for success, but the degree of your success is determined by the degree, degree that you follow the plan he lays out. If I give a carpenter a set of plans for a house, the house will only look like it's supposed to to the degree that he follows the prints. Is that true? So that carpenter could get that blueprint and say, yeah, I see what this says, but man, you know what? I think this would look better. And if he does it according to the picture that's in his head, according to the picture that's on the paper, well, it's not going to look like the paper that I gave him. It's going to look like the picture in his head. That's our life. God said, here's a blueprint, and if you follow it, you're going to live a long, happy, fulfilled, successful life without regret at the end. But if you don't follow it and you go by the picture that's in your head, well, that's the, what you're creating. That's what you're building. Then what? Follow him. Wherever he goes. And then what? Say to the master of the house. Say to him what? The teacher says. Jesus said. So he said, follow him. And when you go in, say to him what I'm about to tell you to say. This is what, I'm, this is what I need you to say. Say what God says. Speak God's word. Only say what God. What if these guys would have got there and they said, hey, man, we know this is a little odd, but we were sent here by this guy, and he said, you know, he would like to come hang out at your house. That ain't what Jesus said. What do you think that man might have done? Get out of here. But when he said, when they said exactly what Jesus said, they got exactly what Jesus told them that they would get. So when when... When we start speaking, we have to speak what God says. What's God say about your situation? The situation that you're the impossible that you're believing for, what's God say about it? But now I'm going to ask you this. What have you been saying about it? Have you been saying what God says? Because you can't expect to get the results that God said you could have if you're not saying what he said. You're just taking it upon Whatever you thought you ought to say, what, what's appropriate. I hear people say stupid stuff all the time. I mean, really? I'm not going to give examples because I may offend some. But I hear people say stupid things all the time, and I just want to grab them and say, why do you say that? Is that what you want your life to look like? Because that's what you're framing it out to be. Don't speak that if that's not how you want your life to be. You want another illustration from the Bible? Samson killed thousands with a jackass jawbone. How many more have been killed with the same weapon? I promise you, the jawbone of a jackass has killed more than any A-bomb ever did. Not only killed them physically, but killed their dreams, killed their potential, killed everything that God offered to them. Because of this right here. We got to think about what we're saying. We can only say what God told us to say. If I say anything more or anything less than God tells me to say, then I can only expect the results of what I said. If I want the results God promised, I got to say what he said. 
their provision wasn't guaranteed if they spoke on their own behalf. Your future is framed by your words. You walk in whatever falls out of your mouth. If you don't want to walk in doo-doo, don't speak it. Because what falls out of your mouth, you step in and it goes before you. And sometimes people's lives stink because of what they've been walking in. And it's only because of what fell out of their mouth. Y'all know anybody whose life just stinks? You ever get in a car and shut the door and say, somebody stepped in something. Well, sometimes people's lives are like that. When you, they get around you, like, somebody stepped in something, and it fell right out of their mouth. You can't say what you think, feel, or see. Oh, you can. Oh, you can. But if you keep speaking what you say, or what you feel, or what you think, I had to get away from somebody a couple of days ago because they were just telling me all about what they feared about this coronavirus. I, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear about your fear. You know what I'm afraid of? I don't care what you're afraid of. I'm battling with the things I'm afraid of. I don't need yours. <laughs> know what I think? No, I'm trying to forget what I think. You know how I feel? No, I don't want to know how you feel. I'm trying to separate myself from my own feelings. I don't need yours. But we all want to say what we think, what we feel, what we see. Look, I see it too. I don't need to say it. Y'all with me? I'm not fussing at you. I'm correcting me. So not only do I have to watch my mouth, I have to watch who's puking in my ear. When you start off the conversation, you know what I think? You just stuck a funnel in my ear and you're about to vomit in it? No. Let me get away, but I may offend them. Well, dear God, they may be fixing to kill my potential. We get so afraid to offend people, we're, but we're willing to offend God. Say what God said. What did God tell you to say? Let's say that. Let's say what God said. Man, when we start saying what God says, there's power in what God said. Do you not know that? There's power in what God You know how you speak? All right, let's go back to the beginning. The beginning is always a good place to start. It says, the, in the beginning, God created man. Okay, And then what did God do? When he formed man with the dust of the ground, then what did God do to bring life to man? He breathed. What did he breathe into man? He breathed the life-giving breath of God into the lungs of man. And what has man breathed ever since? What keeps you alive? If you can't breathe, you can't live. Right? When that horse kicked me in the back the other day or pawed me in the back, I couldn't breathe. I took off. Tika, you were there. I just took off. Where was I going? I don't know, but I was trying to get somewhere where I could find air. Because where I was at, there wasn't any. But if you can't breathe, when you can't breathe, what happens? You panic. You, 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 you could, you're going to panic when you can't breathe. So, the life-given breath of God was transferred into the lungs of man. And ever since, ever since, man has breathed the breath of God. And it's what sustains us physically to stay alive on this earth. Are we in agreement with that? So you breathe the breath of God in and out every day? Okay. What are your words? What forms a word? Your breath. So what you speak, you speak with the breath of God. That's why your words are creative or destructive. Because the breath of God changes things. So your words are actually the breath of God transformed by your mouth and lips and tongue to the image of your heart. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. 
so before we speak a word, we've got to say, now what am I about to conform the breath of God to? Because it's going to change something because my words are, are life or death is in the power of the tongue, the Bible says. So he said that the, a small rudder steers a big ship and we put a bit in a horse's mouth to control all of that power. He said, such is the tongue. So it turns, it steers your life. It, it determines the course of your life because you're speaking the breath of God that you have conformed to the abundance of your heart. We have to be careful what we say because there's power in a spoken word. If we, Now, what happens if we speak God's word with God's breath? In the beginning, back to Genesis, God spoke and the cosmos appeared that were never there. How did that happen? The word of God spoken with the breath of God. Now, you've been given the breath of God in your lungs and the word of God, you've been deputized to speak, you've been authorized to speak. So now, when you speak the word of God with the breath of God, you start transforming things just like God did. Let that sink in. We gotta watch what we say. We gotta don't start talking about your ailments. Don't start talking about your ailments. Start talking about what God said about it. Yeah, I know you might be hurting, but what God say about it? I, I know you. I know there might be a, a condition. What did God say about it? If we don't complain about the symptom and we speak about what God said, we may see it transform. Don't talk about your financial situation. Don't just talk about it. Don't sit around and talk about how broke you are. Talk about what God said. Don't talk about what you need. Talk about what God said concerning your need. Jesus didn't sit back and have a party with the disciples and say, yeah, man, y'all right. That's a lot of people. Whew, this is going to be a tough one. How are we going to pull this off? God, I need you. No. He said, feed them. Then, what's it say next? Back to Mark. Where are we at? The teacher says, where's your guest room? Then it says, then he will show you. Then. Then is the answer to when, right? So the question is when. The answer is then. So then is when. When we have obeyed the command to go. We've stepped out in our commission. We pursued our calling. We've had the divine encounter. We recognize the spirit of God. We followed his instructions. We're walking out the plan. We're speaking the word of God. It's only then that the supernatural provision comes. It don't come when we're sitting at home. It don't come when we're waiting. It comes when we're moving. It comes when we're doing what God said. When we're active. When we're deployed and we're moving. Look, there, there's no need to supply you when you're not moving. It's when we're moving. The provision doesn't come so you can go. Did y'all hear that? The, the, the provision doesn't come so you can go. The provision comes as you go. If you sit back and you wait for provision to come so you can walk out your calling, you missed the bus, Gus. It's gone. You move when God says to move with the understanding that as I walk into it, the provision is there waiting for me. But if I don't walk out, I don't ever walk into the provision. He will show you a large. I like that. God is not the God of the small or the just enough, but he's the God of the more than enough. He's the God who made this planet for us to live on. Then he made all that cosmos just as land yap. You ever think about that? We measure that stuff in light years. And God said, all that? I measure that in the span of my hand. And we can't even fathom the extent of it because it's expanding at the speed of 
the voice of God. Science says light. I say the voice of God. Because when, when his voice travels to the outer limits of the cosmos and it's still saying to be, it continues to be. And it's formed as his voice gets there. That's why we can't even measure it because the voice of God's always going before and add more. And then somewhere, you ever seen a, a galactic print? And then you look at our Milky Way galaxy and it's just a little spot in the cosmos. And then inside of that little spot that's the Milky Way is our little planet that you can't even hardly find if someone don't point it out and you go have a magnifying glass to see our little planet. And then somewhere on that planet it's you. And Jesus died for you. And he made all that just to show off. He's not the God of the small stuff. We, we get so bogged down in our head and we, we think God could never help me with my big old problem. He's a big old God. And then he said all of that stuff and it's so big I hold it in the span of my hand and he said your, your big old earth that you, you think is so enormous, I'll just use it for a footstool. He desires to bring you into a wide place, bigger than you can imagine. The only limit is what we have, or the, the only limit to what we can have is, a, is the degree that we limit our faith. The only thing that limits you is your faith. You can have as much as you can believe for. God said whatsoever. That's pretty open-ended. Whatsoever things you desire when you pray. What, where's the cap on that? Where's the limit to whatsoever? He didn't, he didn't even throw a but in there or an accept. He just said whatsoever. Now, what's so hard about it? What's so big? What's so impossible when I got a God that says whatsoever? What do you dare to trust him for? What do you dare to trust him for? It's not big enough. That miracle that you need, it ain't even big enough. You need to trust him for more. And that's how he wants you to be. Religion says, oh, you shouldn't do that with God. Well, I ask you, why not? Is he too big? Or too small? Does he not love you that much? Ephesians 3.20. Let me show you how my God is. Now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or what? Or even think. He can do, he'll do, he's willing to do more than you can even think. According to the power that works in who? Us. How's his power work in us? By the create, creative power that he placed when he put his breath in my lungs and he put a tongue in my mouth so I can speak his word and I can proclaim a thing and it's established. Because he made me a king and a priest. A king meaning I have earthly authority. A priest meaning I have spiritual authority. And he said when you decree a thing, it's established. Don't get so excited. That's good news. That's good news. We got to watch what we're decreeing. Because it's established. If I'm just decreeing and decreeing, I'm establishing and I'm establishing, but what is it? I'm setting my own boundaries. I'm setting my own limitations. I'm setting myself up for failure just based on, on what I said. He's the God of the exceedingly ab exceeding abundance, but we're quick to get embarrassed. We're quick to get embarrassed by abundance or critical of those who have it. Especially if they're in the ministry. Did y'all did y'all get that? We believe that God is the God of abundance, but if He gives it to us, we become embarrassed. Hello. We become embarrassed by God's blessing in our life. Child of God, that ought not be. We ought not be embarrassed by God's blessing. And listen here. 
And we sure ought not be critical of someone else that got it. Especially someone in the ministry. But let a minister get blessed. And the critics come out the woodwork, especially other ministers. Well, let me ask you this. Who deserves it more? One who brings the gospel to the earth, to the world, or one who carries a ball over a line? But we don't get offended by an athlete making tens of millions of dollars. And we say, oh, look how great. But then there's a man of God that brings the gospel to the, to the nations. And if he gets a little something, everybody wants to bash him for it. That's backwards. That's backwards. Don't let the blessing of God embarrass you. Don't let it get you puffed up in pride. Recognize where it comes from, but sure don't be embarrassed of it. I have to obey what I just said. I only can say what he tells me to say, not what I feel or think. Deuteronomy 20. I'm practicing my own preaching here. Don't, don't provoke me. Deuteronomy 28, 13. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. Hello, church. Church. The Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You shall be above and not beneath. You are, if you heed the commandments, if you go. Of the Lord your God, which I commanded you today. And are careful to observe them. We got to do what God says. And he promises to be the head, not the tail. How can, listen, those of you been with me a while, y'all can answer this already. How can you tell a head from a tail? Hey, I, I, look, there's some critters out there in, our, in nature that you can't tell their head from a tail. They look the same on both ends. There's some people like that. I'm sorry, Lord. <laughs> but listen, how can you tell a head from a tail? By what comes out of it. You can tell a head from a tail by what comes out of it. If you ever have confusion about which ends the head or the tail, watch it long enough. It'll reveal which ends the tail. Listen, how can you tell if you're a head or a tail? By what comes out of you. Is it life or is it death? Is it a blessing or is it a curse? Because let me tell you something. If you speak in a curse, you ain't ahead. If you speak in death instead of life, you're not ahead. You're not acting like one. Upper room. He wants to take you to a higher place. We're called to be lights in darkness. A light illuminates better from a high place. God wants to make you a person of influence if you'll use it for his glory, if you follow his plan. He wants to make you a person of influence. You hear me? Don't start looking at your position and all of that. It has nothing to do with it. He said, I want to make you a person of influence. Well, why would he, God want to make you a person of influence? So you can influence people toward him. How, how are you going to minister to someone if you don't have any influence in their life? But you've got to allow him to bring you to a higher place. Because honestly, the higher you go, the more influence you have. Jesus taught that himself. He said, you don't light a candle and put it under the bed. You put it on a lampstand. Then he said, you're the light of the world. He wants to put you on a lampstand because you can illuminate better from there. Furnished. I, I'm, I'm, I'm coming in for a landing. Furnished. That's the next word, right? Large upper room, furnished. God has laid out beforehand everything that you will need, but it hinges on your obedience to the going to the following of his leading, saying what he said, and recognizing divine encounter. Furnished means you got everything you need. When you buy a home that's furnished, you don't need to add, right? 
Everything that you need is already there. God said, I want to bring you into a life that's furnished. As you go forward, everything that you need is already there waiting for you. But you got to be moving. you got to be going. You, you can't just sit around. you got to be following the call of God. Furnished. Then the next word he said was what? Furnished and what? Prepared. God has laid out beforehand everything that you will need. Oh, that was, that was prepared, I shared. Let's go back to furnished. That supernatural provision, furnished. Everything that you need is along the path of your calling. Everything that you need is along the path of your calling. Everything that you need is along the path of your calling. But if you're not walking down the path of your calling, you're not walking into everything that you need. If you're on another path that's leading somewhere else and your calling's over there, you're not walking into the things that you really need. But if you get on the path that God calls you to be on, everything that you're ever going to need is along that path. It's along the path of your calling. What were you created to do? What is the calling of God on your life? Don't look at what it seems like you need or what you think you have to have. Just walk out God's plan, speak God's word, look for divine encounters, and the supply will be there for what you really need. Then we went on to prepare, and I already read it. It said, God has laid out beforehand everything that you will need, but it all hinges on your obedience. Then the last thing he said was, make it ready for us. God said, I've given you all of this. I brought you to this upper room, to this high place. I got every, it's furnished. Everything that you need is there. Now go make it ready. For who? For us. Who's coming though? Who, who was the main one going to be at that dinner? Jesus. He was really saying, we all coming, but make it ready for me. It's all about making it ready for the coming of Jesus. Why does God need to get the provision in your hand that you need? So you can make it ready for the coming of Jesus. That's what this supernatural provision is all about. That's what supernatural supply is really all about. It's about getting you everything that you can need, you need so that you can make the coming, make things ready for the coming of Jesus. Because guess what? If Jesus showed up today, a lot of people ain't ready. And a lot of us will say, are saying, if I had the things that I need, I'd go help make it ready. But the things that we need come as we step out and go and start to do. He said to his disciples, have it ready for me when I get there. And he's saying the same thing to us today. He said, I'm coming. Make it ready for me. It's about preparing for his coming. That's really what provision is all about. Mark 14, 16. That's the next verse. So his disciples went out and came to the city and found it just like he said. And they prepared for the Passover. As we walk it out, as we walk it out, we will find it just as he said. As we walk out the plan of God, we will find it just as he said. We walk into the fulfillment of the promises. All of those things that we said we are, we walk into the fulfillment of those if we follow this map. We walk into the fulfillment. It all starts with go. It all started with go. It all went back to when he said go. That was step one. Go. Now I'm asking you, what has God called you to? I'm saying to you, he said go. He said do it. He said get it started. Get it moving. Let's get going. Let's get deployed. Don't look at, well, I will when he supplied. No, get going, then he supplied. Well, I'm waiting for the door to open. Kick it open. Make something happen. Make a move. I dare you, make a move. Make a move. What, what, what's the dream he's placed in your heart? That ought to give you a good idea of what your calling is. That's a good place to start. 